Okay, folks, today I got the perfect situation. This horse, Gray, is a five-year-old, okay? He's like a lot of horses that are young, but have been trained, if that's the word you want to use, absolutely wrong, okay? It isn't like he's been beat on. It's just that he wasn't, he doesn't understand where his feet are. He's been ridden a lot. So ridden a lot means he's cold jawed, hollow back, and I, that's what we have to fix before we can teach him to be accurate with his feet. So his automatic response, when I put pressure on him, is to go into pressure. So the concept of release, which is what my beliefs are all upon, is not in his brain at all. There's none. So I have to explain to him and teach him what the, what the word release means. So I'm going to show you first how he thinks. And I'd like you to watch the skeleton of the horse. And then we'll walk through it from there. But I got a sneak and hunch. This is not the only horse in the United States that has this problem. So now I'm going to ask him to back up. And I'll do it with two hands because I'm riding my snaffle. And you see how his head comes up? He's preparing himself to brace through the neck and the jaw. So there's your classic upside down horse. So now if I pull harder, he just gaps at the mouth and I'm literally pulling him backwards. See him bracing right there? Okay, that's what, that's what he figured out to do to survive. Now if the bar ain't set too high, hell he's fine, he's ready to go to the world. But I, I have a little higher request for a horse than that. So what I'm going to do is show you what I do personally to help a horse like this understand. Now you can hear the cricket, so it's not like he's scared to death. He just knows that when there's pressure, he needs to just brace against it. That's what he's been taught to do. So I'm going to ask him again. I need you to walk backwards, if you would. Now you can see my dressage mirror on the ground, so I'm, I can kind of keep an eye on things if I want to. But I'll tell you one thing anybody can see this without having their eyes open so there's the the part that we don't care for right there okay now in this video i want you to do two things and one of them is that there's a lady that got a hold of me that's been in the english world and the western world and i know that she's a good hand because of the question she asked and you've heard me talk about a hackamore and I never, ever, ever pull with both hands with a hackamore. I always bump and release. Okay, so if I bump and release on this horse, he's not going to make the connection. So I have to put enough pressure to move a boxcar and pull him backwards. So she asked about what I call setting up a wall. And what it means, when I get my helper, which is the nose band, I can set up the wall, which I'll show you, and then the horse is going to give instead of me pulling it backwards. Thanks. Okay, folks. Now, this is a nose band. It keeps the mouth shut. That's all it does. Now, all I want it to do is keep the mouth shut. This is temporary. Depending on the horse and my timing, this will go away in a week or 10 days, never to be used again. What I want you to note today is that this nose band is on the bone. That's solid. Down here is the cartilage where I tell you I put my bosal. Cartilage is not is a part of bone, but it's not as solid as a bone. Cartilage is like caulking. So if you see a horse's mouth closed with a strap above and a strap below and a roller buckle, then you've entered the dressage world on the dark side. And this gets screwed down so tight that these bones are broken. And that is not what I do. Okay, now folks, this horse has never had any groundwork done, which is going to happen where he's going. 
and I've showed him just enough by saddling and catching him to respect the halter. But what I'm going to do is cut to the chase because I know he's gentle. I mean, this is a gentle horse. So now I'm going to set up the wall. It's not pressure and release. It's nothing but him pushing on pressure. I'll do my math and my hands do not go higher than the mane. My arm is straight. Here comes the wall. My legs have nothing to do with this unless the horse gets crooked. There's the pressure. Now he's going to try to open his mouth. Now I want to show you how much pressure is on him. It's not like a guitar string right now. It's just a rain. And what will happen is, so don't get discouraged if you try this. It's going to get good and then bad and then good and then bad and then good. It's nothing personal. He has been trained to do the opposite of what I asked. So here I am again. And I can see his mouth. And I'm not going to release now. You think you reward the slightest try and give him a carrot or whatever? No, he's five years old. Now I'm going to increase the pressure. And he's going to push on it. I just took another inch. Now what he's doing is he's making a connection between that pressure and his feet. I'm not going to release. I'm going to increase the pressure. Now here's the moment. From up here there's an S in his neck. From where I'm sitting, he's going to try to take the bit away and he's going to push on it. I feel it on the bottom of my little fingers. Now he's working out his options. Getting behind the bit. It's still the pressure when he brings his head out. Now he's pushing on the bit. A lot of times they'll go left and right with their skull. There's right. So now he's pulling on my left rein. Now he's pulling on both of my hands. So at this point, I get to change the language. Now watch my, watch my posture. I sit up and I take my legs off. I'm on my seat bones and I'm holding the wall. There is no give. Now, if his foot connects and steps back, now I can in fact release. He's trying to figure this bit out, how to be able to push on it. He can't take off, he can't open his mouth. So the reason why I put the nose band on is because I just cut my time in half. You can get them to not go gap their mouth over time, but I don't need to waste that time. I can fix it right now and then get rid of the nose band. So now I'm on my way. So to, to be fair and have a clean slate, I'm going to walk him forward. And then I'll just sit down because we're starting to learn what stop means. I've done the math on my hands and now I'm going to set my hands again. My legs are off and I'm not looking at the horse's head. He's pushing. Checking out his options. My legs are off. Not on. Watch my left knee. Off. On. Off. On. That's how you take your leg off a horse. The reason it's off is because if his hind quarter goes left or right, I can fix it with my foot. Now, he's complacent in this position, but I really need him to walk backwards. So I'm going to increase the pressure. I just did. My legs are off. Now, he has to intentionally walk backwards, not just one step. Thank you so much. Now he's telling himself, I got to figure out how to get away from this. He's created the pressure himself, not me. I'm not pulling. <sighs> Let him know it's not a contest. It's not a problem. Just walk backwards. I'm going to increase the pressure. We'll worry about self-carriage and collection later. Right now, we just need him to walk backwards. Intentionally. How many steps? Well... Be true to yourself. I know what I need. I need at least three good steps of him walking backwards. Now I can saw in his mouth like I've heard people say you're supposed to floss their teeth. 
or I can just sit here. I'm not hurting him. My mouthpiece is solid. You can see how much of his brain is focused on me. Zero. His brain is focused on that mouth to try to figure out how to be able to push his head out. I will increase the pressure again. I don't care if he overbridles. None of it matters. I need him to make a connection to his feet. So for the lady that sent me the email, this is when I put up a, a wall and hold steady until the horse gives. This particular horse this day. Now he's walking into pressure, so I'll increase it again. Now he's stepping back. Now he gets to make a decision. One, two, three. Now I'm watching his tongue. The tongue comes out, it means he's nervous. I can touch him and stop the cricket. This is the time when I get to communicate with the horse and I'm trying to tell him, don't worry about your mouth, don't worry about your brain, just, just walk backwards. My legs are hanging on the horse now, they're not off. I'm sitting like a sack of spuds. So now when I reach for those reins, I already know the math, I'm going to rise to the occasion, so to speak. Here it comes. Thank you so much. Please stay with it, you're fine. Don't worry about it. You're gonna make it. <sighs> Increasing. Now I'm increasing half of what I increased the first time because I need him to evolve and get a chance to make it. He's about, he's loading up. I can feel him loading up his skeleton. Think, connect your foot. This time it'll be one foot is all I need. Here comes the pressure. I just increased it another half an inch, waiting. Moves his head to the right, pushing on my hands. Can't get back in the position he was before we started this whole wreck. And he's really, really thinking and he's about to move and I'm just waiting. I'm not gonna pull. I just put up a wall and he's gotta yield to it. I can feel his skeleton trying to make it, make his foot move. Once again, I'm going to slow that cricket down. So now, to me, his ears are going to start to alternate. We're actually in the classroom now. We weren't in the classroom. So I'll see his reaction when I pick up these reins. Now, here it comes. Bingo. Now I'm gonna pay him off for that now. And his brain is gonna go everywhere. And then he's gonna check in when I reach for the reins. That's why I lay him down. We've already heard this story a hundred times. Now watch his ear. He just checked in. Here it comes. My legs are off. My horse is walking backwards. He's pushing on my hands. It's started. I'm not gonna pay him off this time. I could be here till tomorrow. I'm gonna increase the pressure. Now I'm holding the pressure. Because from where I'm sitting, see, he's still thinking he can take these reins away and push on me. That's why I'm not giving. And you just got to take my word for it. But the good news is now his neck is not bowed the opposite direction. Now his neck is bowed the correct direction. Legs are off. Here comes the pressure. And there. I just added another half an inch. I'm telling him you need to walk backwards as soon as you can because that's just the way it works around here. Now, don't think a horse is stubborn because this horse isn't stubborn. He's, a, he's thinking, he's thinking, how can I get back the way it used to be when I could put my head upside down and go through the bridle? 
Well, partner, you can't. Here comes the pressure one more time. More pressure. If you don't have a big enough bubble in your reins, it's going to run into the saddle horn. There. Now, this is the most aggression he's put into his mouth so far. Because he's starting to get... I'll go ahead and use the word. He's starting to get upset. He doesn't like this. So all I got to do is contemplate what's for lunch and take him through the tunnel. Legs are off. Pressure's on. Holding. And you got to know, I knew this morning when I ate breakfast he was going to walk backwards. It's not like I'm wondering. There is no wonder. No, he went into the bit and walked forward to go through it. Then he walked backwards. Or I pulled him backwards. All right, he's had time to think. Now, for what it's worth, he hasn't changed his mind. Now, when he does, I'll know it, and so will you. <sighs> Exhale, sit down. Now, here's the bubble. That's how much room you need between your hands. If you have this much, you're going to fail. If you have this much, you're going to win. If you do the math, when I go past this saddle horn, this bubble's not going to hit the horn. And here it comes. Thank you so much. Now, he doesn't like this, but he is figuring out to move his feet. My left leg is on. My left leg is on. When his right leg moves over, then I can take my leg off, which I just did. Here it comes. That was the first time he tried the hip thing. Please understand that when a horse isn't doing real well up here, he'll start moving his hindquarter left and right, which is the same thing as pushing on the reins. He's just trying to get away from my hands. Well, when Captain Obvious lands, he's just going to walk backwards. Here it comes. Thank you so much. You're fine. Here it comes. Thank you so much. It's still the same story, horse. It's the exact same thing I asked the very first time. Options. Options. I'm thinking it's going to take me five hours to get to Vegas. Now I released, but I did not lay the reins down. Where were we? Oh, yes. Walk backwards. Thank you so much. You're behind the bridle, but that's irrelevant. I released, but I did not lay the reins down. We're, we're climbing the ladder. Now I'm going to put the pressure on. And now the tables have turned. It's not on the horse. It's on me. How well can I do this? How good is my timing? You can't say stupid horse, stubborn horse. Oh my God, you should have seen him. None of that. Here's what you do. <sighs> Thank you so much. Now I can give. This is the change of the story that I talked to the young lady about. Now I'm able to give the rein and meet him halfway. Now I'm not doing this. Watch. Oh my God. That's not how you train a horse. You give a quarter of an inch. You don't give the whole rein back in this situation. This is not a two-year-old in the first ride. Now, here it comes. Thank you so much. Way to go. Now, I'm not going to release until I feel some kind of intent. Once again, my right hand. Stop the cricket. He's like... Okay. Now, how well can I present myself to my horse? Do I have patience? Yes. Am I in a hurry? No. And please walk backwards. Thank you so much. Keep going. My legs are off. Now, they're going to get incorporated here pretty soon, but right now they're off. Pressure. Because he sticks his nose out. Release one quarter of an inch. Pressure. If you'll notice, my hands are getting higher. Pressure. Good. There's the first time he's had a deep exhale. Big medicine. Turned his head to the right. Forward. Now he's walking tentative. As soon as he walked tentative, he tells me that his brain's kicked in. Because he knows he's going to get pressure to go backwards. 
Here it comes, horse. Now my hands are not down here any longer. I'm evolving. Legs are off, pressure's on, foot moved, I gave. Pressure's on, I gave. Pressure's on. My legs are off. Now the fence on my right isn't a crutch, it's a visual. It helps. I'll move away from it when he gets to understand, but I've took away 50% of his options with his hindquarter. Now I can start the pressure and release thing. But you got to know the pressure is equal. It's not like a hackamore. There. Brand new game, what you just watched. Look at my tracks. Drag marks in the dirt. That means he's on the forehand and his brain is saying no. Well, that's all wonderful, but he's going to do it with some kind of dignity. I already know he is. He's not a bronco. He's just a horse that never learned the correct way to do this. Now, I'm prepared. I have my bubbles there. I'm looking up. This time I'm going to drop my seat and see if he stops. I dropped my seat. Took him another step. He's given to me. See it? His head's still too low. But he has, in fact, put the slack in my rein. Now I'm going to say, I need you to walk backwards. My legs came off. He understood it. I'm giving the rein back. I need you to walk intentionally backwards on a loose rein. 100 pounds of weight. 100. Zero. 200. Hips starting to move out of position. My left foot's on. Move the hip over. Asking. Pressure. Release. Right leg on. Pressure. Release. 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 Now, I know that he knows that I know that he knows. It's over. It doesn't mean the video is over. It means the learning curve has just gone over the top. He knows exactly what to do now. Now, if I walk up there and he doesn't do it, it has nothing to do with me. He just hasn't agreed to go ahead and do it all the time. He will. So all I got to do is present myself correctly and have some patience. And he'll be just fine. So now I get to practice my stop again. My legs are off. I will exhale and sit down. Now I need you to walk backwards. Here it comes. See the height of my hands now? There's the give. Oh, incidentally, for all you people in Wisconsin, this is not how you back a horse up. That's how you milk a cow. It's the dairy state. Close your hand. Good. Now his feet are getting the idea. And he's going back to his old ways. Remember I told you he's going to do that. And that's fine. I want him to get that over with. So he doesn't feel like he needs to do it. Now what you need to know. If I had... 15 pounds of pressure when I started. Now I'm down to like four. I've said it before. This is the most important part. You set the reins down. So when I pick them up, they're actually going to mean something. You watch him. He's going through the antics. He's no different than a small child. They're just kind of, let me go, let me go. I want to go out and play. I don't want to do this. I'm tired of this. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, I'm not done yet. Now, when I reach... He'll pick up a life of some kind and I'll say, I need you to walk forward. There, he's breaking at the third vertebrae now. Now he dropped his head low, but it doesn't matter. I just raised my hand. I'm going to stop. You all know the three positions of the reins. Okay, now that's coming into play. We've gone from kindergarten to seventh grade here. Here it comes. Thank you so much. This is a horse intentionally walking backwards without me pulling. He's crowding the fence. I put my right foot on him. Backing. Left leg on. What he needs to understand is that it's, it, it just, you don't stop until I ask you to stop. And when I sit down and relax my body, that's when it's over. There. Falling apart. So there's the fair leader. And there's resentment. Had I excelled at this and got a tw double twisted wire whatever, 
and a training fork and who knows what all they sell, it would cause resentment. I want him to back up and feel just as comfortable as he does walking forward. Then he's like, okay, so that's where I'm at. Okay, uno mas. Asking, I'm riding with some borderline dignity. He's starting to bridle up in the correct position. Please walk backwards. Now, here it comes. Watch my elbows. Now remember, I didn't fail. He just hadn't processed it all. He's going to find out that the smartest thing to do is to walk backwards. There you go. Thank you so much. Right leg on. I feel him drifting. He stepped back into place. Release. Pressure. Release. How many intentional steps can I get? One, two. Thank you so much. He just made two steps without dragging. There's actual hoof marks. I know he wears an ot shoe. Okay, now he gets time to think. But I'm not getting off. He's going to get to process. So, Deb, if I could have my piece of paper, we'll do the Dear Abby thing. Okay, folks. First, we got a bunch of... I don't need my glasses for this. I don't think. Anyway, I got to do the Dear Abby deal. Those of you that don't know Dear Abby, too bad. This book, A Fortunate Life, was sent to me from somebody in Australia. Now, I think it's borderline humor because they didn't put a return address on it, but it didn't take a lot to figure out that it came from Australia. And whoever sent it, I want to thank you because it was a classic. I mean, this is a really good book. And all it is is a normal man that had a very amazing life. And he got knocked down and he got up. And he got knocked down and he got up. Now, the, the, the interesting part for me personally is the timeline starts in about 1908. And at the exact same time, this man was sent away to work for a person at eight years old. My grandmother in Miles City, Montana, was sent away to work for a person at 10 years old. The first person he went to turned out to be an outlaw, literally. They were cattle thieves and horse thieves. And they treated him terrible. My grandmother, who took her little brother with her, turns out the woman was a cow thief. And she exchanged slick calves for favors. And they were outlaws and never paid her. So she ran away and then he got away. And then from there on, it's just a matter of a whole bunch of things that he ran into in life that most of us can relate to. And he never quit. So thank you very much for that. Now, the next one, this is, this is earth shattering. My hat. I can't tell you how many people have asked where I get my hat. Well, I get it at a hat store. That would be D Bar M in Reno, Nevada. The reason why it's shaped like it is because I'm known as a flat hatter. The California style, which is before the buckaroos in Nevada, incidentally. And I've been told through reading that one of the ideas is that the flat hat comes from the Basque herders because they wore black flat brimmed hats when they came to America. The other side is there's sombra and there's sombrero. Sombra means shade. The wider the brim, the more the shade. So that might play into this in the Southwest. And on the herder story, if you know anything about the Basque people that came over here, a lot of them had a beret. Now there was French Basque and Spanish Basque. But it doesn't mean they all came over here in flat hats. Catalan is another place in Spain, and you'll watch and see the black hats over there. So, moving right along, I will ask my lovely assistant to give me the cow hobbles. And I would like to show you, because somebody wanted to know about cow hobbles. And it was interesting, because this person has cowboyed in Arivaca which is in Arizona, and it's miners, cowboys, and smugglers. And I thought that was kind of interesting, because hardly anybody knows where Arivaca is. I wintered down there. I won't tell you which one I was, but I did winter there. So the cow hobble is made with chain links and a piece of rope, 
so that you can put one on a, a front and a hind leg and the cow stays in the proximity of where you left it. Because if you tied it down flat on its side around this country in the summer, when it's 100 plus degrees, when you get back, the cow will in fact be dead. Okay, so all this is is a chain link and a rope doubled pushed through it. So the other option you have is to cut up your wife's dog chain and get the link out and then you egg it on the anvil. I made it a little bit wider so that you just make it egged out until it matches the diameter of the rope. Now all you guys on ranches I know you shoe your own horses so you're going to have an anvil. Correct? Okay. That's the cow hobbles. That's how it works. I carry the links in my pocket because I have in fact lost these hanging across the back of my saddle. The link falls off which means there's too much egg. Okay. Next is the um, bloat stick. Thank you. Now this is what they put on me in Catholic school to make me shut up. I'm just kidding. Somebody asked me about what do you do about bloat in an emergency situation. Well, the word emergency and everybody on ranches have dealt with bloat. And that's where the left side, the gut fills up with gas and the cow actually dies from being suffocated from the inside. All that pressure pushes on, pushes on their esophagus and they die. So those of us that have been around us a while, if you see a near-death situation going on, you just walk up and stick them with your knife. And it lets the air out, but the bad news is, is that the gut now has a hole in it, and the rumen that you just punched a hole in will in fact leak into the peritoneal. So now this one that you saved the life on, four months later could be dead because it's septic. Okay. Under a controlled situation, we sew in what's called a trocar, which looks like a corkscrew. And that's all done in a chute and under, you know, sanitary conditions and everything's wonderful. But what I did in the feedlot is that when I saw what we call high-sided, high-sided means it's starting to bloat. And it's not considered bloat, it's just high-sided. So you see a yearling that's high-sided, you pull him. A pull is a sick animal. He goes into the pen that's going to go through the chute in the hospital, we call it. So he gets doctored for something. It's blatantly obvious that he's high-sided. So what I did was I would take this stick, which is a handle of something, because we all don't like to push brooms. Just cut the end of the broom off and then make a midget do it. And I would drill two holes in it. And then I would go over behind the ears and stick this in the mouth. And pull the stick up in their mouth to make them smile. Don't, don't be kind with it. Pull it up. Then you tie it off. And what I did, because of the way the feedlot was set up, I put them on the scales. Because I could ride pins still. And I could see them on the scale. And I knew that was the only animal on the scale. And I could watch them go down. What this does is it makes them chew. And their mouth starts moving. And when their mouth moves, then they, they expel the gas a little bit at a time. And then I could just let them out. Now, you, you mark them somehow, and then you find out if they're a chronic, meaning they're always going to do this bloat thing, that's when you put a trocar in it. They can spend the whole winter with a little puff of steam coming out their back. It looks kind of cool from a distance. I think if you do it with a piece of grass, it'll make a whistle, but I don't know. Okay. So that is what I call a bloat stick. The other way, you don't carry these with you very often. But the largest gauge needle you can find has been known to save the life on something. Guys out in the brush, they'll just tip something over and they'll stick that needle on that big swollen part on the left, high and on the left, and it'll let the air out. Well, that's an emergency situation. And then there's things called bloat guard. Now, bloat guard was a product that had what they called proloxylene, which is more syllables than I'm used to. So an old timer told me, he says, that's all wonderful that you're paying that big money for that, but why don't you just put Epsom salts in loose salt? So I mixed a, a bag of Epsom salts from the grocery store, looks like a milk carton, with 50 pounds of loose salt, and I didn't have any bloat problems. This was cattle on feed. 
and it didn't cost me the cost of that multi-syllable word. So the idea is that you expel the gas and they don't bloat. Now in the trivia world, just in case, when a feedlot is made and there's a bunk, the bunk is where the feed goes. On the cattle side of the bunk, there's a slab that's about 18 inches to two feet wide. And it's poured the entire length of the, of the bunk, which can be 700 feet long. So when cattle walk up to it, their front feet stand up on the concrete and their hind feet are lower in the back. If you can lower the back of a steer and he's ingesting feed this way, he'll expel gas the other way. If he's eating level or downhill, it's not going to be as easy. So that's why you pour a slab in front of a bunk. And people that don't pour slabs in the middle of winter end up with the cattle trying to reach over the bunk because of all the mud. Well, that pretty well covers that because if it comes up at a cocktail party, you're going to need to know all this stuff. Now, I think that's it. Let me check my list. And then we'll uh, wrap this up. Now, my, con my student here has been thinking all this time. Oh, yeah. Schooling Chinaco on cattle. A man wanted to see me work a cattle or a colt for the first time in a tub. And something else. Well, that ain't going to happen. Where I cowboy, there are no tubs. And I know what you're talking about. But I would not use a colt in a tub until there are no cattle in the tub. And then I would take the colt to it so I could go easy. Because what happens, for those of you that have been around a tub, the ones that aren't built very well have a rail on the bottom. There's like four of them because it's shaped like a wagon, half a wagon wheel. Colts hang up their feet on those because they don't know what to do with them. So now a colt hangs his foot up and then you've got this tub gate coming around and it hooks on the horse's foot. You pin the horse's foot to the ground. Okay, two things can happen. You can die or they can be crippled. So when there's no cattle to be bothered about, then you go in and school your horse on working them in a tub. And then anybody that's a cowboy knows that when it's your turn to run the tub, you go in there and you put a load in, which is a draft. Maybe it's 20 head, depending on the size of your tub. Then everybody will watch you get off, loosen your cinch, and go put your colt away and get on a real horse. So that's why you won't see me doing that on Chinaco. Everybody that's a good hand does not have a problem with a man taking his time to school a horse and then taking his time to go get a fresh horse. If somebody's yelling at you, you know, we're waiting on you, da-da-da, then just quit. Okay. Roping a cow by one hind leg instead of two. The word cow. Cow probably weighs anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. If you rope her by two hind feet, which I have been known to do, that means she's going to drop right where she is or she's going to really pull on you. What I do is I don't want two hind feet. I want one hind foot. So now when she tries to pull away from me, she's on three legs, but I've got one leg off the ground. So I stay dallied and I just walk with her. And I walk with her, but I keep the rope tight. And if she's really having, a, you know, really strong, I just slide rope. That's why the rubber on the horn doesn't work for this story. So now she's walking and she's walking and I'm following her across the pasture and then pretty soon she stops. Now I turn my horse around, like you probably saw in another video, and then I start walking the other way. Now she has to back up. So the time she spent walking forward, she was burning all her energy up. And if I'd have just healed her by two hind feet and jerked her down and then got off, she'd have still had all that energy in there to jump around on the ground, get up, smack me, smash me, whatever. So I took the air out of her, so to speak, by letting her walk on three legs. Now I turn around and walk the other way and I slide a rope while I'm walking and she will sit down. Then she'll stand up, then she'll sit down. And I start again and then about the third time she'll usually just lay down on her side. Now you go to all the trouble of getting a quiet rope, turn around, get short, tie off, get off, tie the two hind legs together and go on with it. That's why I don't rope them by two feet right off the bat. Now, in an emergency, which means your partner headed one he probably shouldn't have, you need to catch two feet and get her, get her subdued so she doesn't kill him. But it depends on how much you like him. Okay. The last thing I can just tell you about, because you've seen this a hundred times, is that the coastal range versus the long range. Well, Ray Ordway was mentioned in this email. Ray was the Tom Dorrance 
of the California Cowboys. In other words, everybody respected him. And he just left us a year or so ago. And whenever I had a question about bridle horses, I called Ray Ordway. Anyway, he's the one that told me about coastal reins. The short story is coastal reins are 28 inches long. Horse show reins are 54. Okay, so nobody can find coastal reins. Well, I get them in Mexico and have them made. Doesn't matter. The long reins, for me, are too long. And I was told that that was used up more in the foothills. Now, why? I have no idea. I think because of the steepness of the hills, they needed to give them more rain. Doesn't matter. All I know is that I use a coastal rain so that I can put my palm concha, which you've seen. And the math works out that it's the roping position. I can rope, I can dally, and I don't have a whole bunch of rain sticking up through my hand. I've seen a couple people that get a palm concho. And they put it on the long rain, and now it's no longer a palm concho. It's a Christmas ornament because the reins are sticking way up here and the concho is flopping around. I don't even want to go there. Okay. So that pretty well takes care of the deer. Oh, yeah. Why does my horse hit? No, forget that. Anyway, we're good. I'm going to back this horse up. Now, if it's like dragging a donkey backwards, it has nothing to do with me. I didn't fail. The horse just ain't buying it yet. I got to keep my bloat stick because you never know. You so now, yep. Yeah. Now I'm going to get prepared the way I originally did. If I don't need all this, I won't use it, but I'm going back to square one. Legs off, looking up, pressure, horse backed up. Now I'm going to ask him to bring his nose down. I will lower my hands to get that done. You're fine, don't worry, I'm looking at my mirror. Now please understand that I'm not pulling him back anymore. He's walking backwards, I'm done, this is over. He's done, he's got it, goodbye. Mm -hmm.